Okay. Um, maybe we can start off with the easy ones. Yeah, sure. So I book for the three medium questions. So, yeah. So after we, and well, I also work on the easy problem. So we can discuss about it. Yeah, I, I thought the easy ones are good to just discuss. I mean, we don't really need to, well, except for, yeah. except for the, the third easy one. That's a bit more yeah. involved. Um, but all right, let's just, uh, let's start with the easy ones. And then um, hopefully Kent will be here by the time we get to the, the medium ones. Okay, because it is, yeah, it is 106, my time. Six past. Um, so yeah, so, so for the first three, the easy ones, um, I mean, they're all pretty, Simple. So we have that bread dough rises because of yeast. Yeah. Um, and so the ones that some uh, moderating variables that occurred to me were temperature, uh, altitude, oh. and I, I assume that uh, one thing a person could consider is time. But I uh, this kind of gets to later. When we uh, or well in eight in eight three sorry easy three they're all they're all chapter eight but um in the easy three like where you have to decide what the actual dependent variable is so anyway but the, the main ones that I thought of were just I mean I, this is a question more about baking and about interactions I think but about temperature and altitude is what I thought of well I only think about the temperature so you have one more and. For uh, the second one, so about education leads to higher income, I can think of um, maybe like age or even gender these days, unfortunately. And yeah, at um, like ethnicities and maybe also um, family background. Because yeah, I can imagine there are a lot of socioeconomic status or socioeconomic um, characteristics that can affect one's income, even without involving education or with involving education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, I'm trying to think. So, so I actually I did have I had sex uh, as well. That was actually the first one that I, I came up with. That just the, the returns to education are, are lower, maybe if, because of discrimination. I think that's also what you had in mind. Mm -hmm. Ones that seem that seem very uh, are, are two that also seem relevant that I wasn't thinking of first, but then later occurred to me were the where you get your education. Oh, so like yeah. you could have quality of education, and then also the particular degree because different. You could spend, you know, six years getting a data science degree, PhD, or well, that'd be a bit long, but and then versus getting an English degree, and one of those two is gonna pay quite a bit more. That's true. And uh, this last one, gasoline makes a car go. This one was kind of it was kind of hard. Uh, so there's a thing called a, an emergency brake that just prevents your car from going. So it's kind of, it's a binary variable. Yeah. Um, that, so I thought that that would be one. Or I, I didn't know how silly of examples he wanted. So I could put like having a motor. Like, like that having is a motor true. is also necessary. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because, well, I'm assuming maybe he's asking something about the distance. Um, um, yeah, or the mileage. Mm. of the car that's why that's what i can think of because yeah i mean if a car doesn't have wheels then how can it possibly go right even though it has liters of gasoline which is very weird if he asked for that specific uh framing of the question so 
Yeah, uh, yes. as, that's mm -hmm. a good one. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess we probably shouldn't spend more time on those because they're pretty. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, so with some of these, I this week, I guess it was almost kind of a, a frustrating week in that sometimes I was trying to figure out why he was asking a question. Like, what am I supposed to learn? Oh, I just muted myself. Uh, maybe we'll come across some of those. Uh, but I, I like the, the next four a little bit more, I think. Did you do the, this upcoming group of four? Yeah, I did. OK. I, I guess I'll start. We'll take turns. I'll do the, the odd ones. Sure. Um, so for caramelizing onions requires cooking over low heat and making sure onions don't dry out. Uh, I think that one is pretty obvious that it does because, uh, well, I'll just read what I wrote. I said it invokes an interaction because both have to be present. When I said both, I, meant, I meant the low heat and not drying out. So neither by itself will caramelize onions and because neither can compensate for the absence of uh -huh. the other. So it, it's very much like the water and shade example from the tulips. Yeah, that's true. And for the second um, part, the car will go faster when it has more cylinders or when it has better fuel injector. Yeah, I think it invokes an interaction as well because yeah, I would imagine if a car has a lot of cylinders and a really nice, uh, a great fuel inject injector, then it will go faster than if it only have um, either a lot of cylinders or um, the fuel injector. But I'm really not into cars, so <laughs> I cannot explain the details behind that. But I guess that makes um, sense to me. Yeah, so I, I also don't know a lot about cars. So but for this one, though, I actually said there was no interaction, at least the way he stated it. So I mean, what you said is mm -hmm. true, I assume. I assume that, I mean, yeah, I, I assume that having a, a better fuel injector allows. It's like, I definitely get, I, I'm just trying to think, um, like, why, why did I say not an interaction for this one, but an interaction? I think, I think, so it's the nature of and versus or. So in the first one, ah, there's an right. and. So it requires this and this. Kind of like the mm -hmm. tul tul tulips one, again, requires That's water true. and shade. And here it's like, it requires cylinders, like speed requires cylinders or a fuel injector. Huh. So I think that was, so I think what you said is substantively right, but there was something about the way he phrased it that led me but to say, when you think about it, if we have like two booleans and then we have the or operations, through and through will also result in true, right? So it's not an exclusive or. Right, right. So uh, I don't know. I, I'm not sure that that's uh, the meaning of or that he intended here, but I can, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. That one. Yeah, that, that is interesting. I don't, I, I feel like we, I mean, I, I, I don't know. I don't pretend to know what's inside Richard McEllar's head, but I feel like, <laughs> I feel like you uh, thought too deeply about Boolean logic. <laughs> <laughs> I guess he was so. like, he, he, if you had written this in his class, he'd be like, no, this is not a logic class. This is a, I, I don't know what he would write. That's why I don't know. Um, yeah. But no, I, I think that you're, su you're substantively, subst substantively right. All right, so I guess to go to this one. Um, so the next one is, most people acquire their political beliefs from their parents unless they get them from their friends. Uh, this one, I was pretty straightforwardly an interaction. Um, it's an interesting interaction. It's like, a, I thought, where it's like, if a thing happens, it's kind of like a light switch almost like, yeah. Um, so it's not like, it's something that just turns one thing off. So it's not like a, so it, it is a moderator, 
but it's an interesting moderator where it's just like a it turns something off or turns something on um which i don't which i actually um it was one of the more interesting ones to try to write out uh, an equation for in part three of the easy ones i i never got to a equation i was super satisfied with but it, it just seems you need like a well, we can talk about it later, but it's kind of like an indicator variable strategy. Anyway, but yeah, so to me, it was an interaction. Hmm. Well, for me, I couldn't see any interaction here because I can only see um, like two variables here. So one, the political beliefs, and the second is the source of the political beliefs. Mm -hmm. And the source of political beliefs to me, yeah, it can be either categoric index or um, dummy variable uh, in my mind. So I'm not entirely sure where's the, um, like what's the third um, variable that we can uh, have here. Well, so, so to me, uh, I, mean, I mean, the nature of an interact, like just going, let me hear, um, okay, so, he says, so yeah, so I'm just going back to like basically the beginning of the chapter where he writes to model deeper conditionality or just conditionality where the importance of one predictor depends upon the importance of another predictor, right? And then he says, we need interaction. Um, and so, and just that phrase where the importance of one predictor depends upon another. And so that describes exactly what happens in this parent's political beliefs example, because the importance of the predictor parents' political beliefs depends completely on the presence of friends. Mm. So if friends are present, that just All erases right. the effect of, it takes whatever it, what it was gonna be to zero. So I was like, oh, that's definitely an interaction. Like it's, again, it's a weird interaction. Oh um, yeah. But it okay. is. It, what he describes as a uh, conditionality. Okay, so I think I understand now what you mean by light switch. So when patterns is one, then the friends automatically become zero and vice versa, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, all right. Okay, for the fourth one, yeah, I'm very unsure about this because um, my intuition tells me that yeah, maybe there is a, some sort of interaction here, but I'm not entirely sure uh, because for dogs, they are sm um, smart, social, but they don't necessarily have manipulative appendages. Whereas octopus, yeah, they are social, I guess, but yeah, I'm not entirely sure they're social. I'm pretty sure they're smart, but I'm not entirely sure that they are social. Mm. So it's, to me, it doesn't seem to be a straightforward relationship between the sociability and possession of manipulative bandages. Yeah, to this one, so yeah, I think in a way you got further thinking about this one that I had trouble even thinking about, I mean, he, so the prompt, the overall prompt for easy two is which of the following explanations involves an interaction. Then I just got stuck thinking, how is four even an explanation? It's just a kind of yeah. descriptive statement. You just look out, have some measure of in intelligence, and it's like just noting, oh, that intelligent one is social. Oh, that intelligent species has manipulative, append manipulative appendages. Like I, I was trying to think about what is even, because I don't think, uh, yeah, I was just I was trying to think about what is even like the causal path. And I don't think, I don't think he's necessarily trying to say sociability causes intelligence or mm -hmm. intelligence causes social, like, so I, I had yeah. trouble even starting to think about this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So, so I, I really don't have anything. I remember <laughs> I fell asleep yesterday kind of thinking about this one. Uh, and I, I remember thinking that I had it. I was like, oh, I, I understand now. And I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what it was. So, so if if it was I, it was either a sleep sleepy illusion or I forgot it. So I don't know. Um. Yeah. Anyway. I, yeah. I guess we can skip this. And and I guess Kent might not be here. So. Mm -hmm. Um. I don't know, that's kind of sad. Oh, I implicitly, I was going to just say we should start with medium. But if you want to talk about, if you discovered any interesting things while trying to write the linear models, uh, I would be interested to know. Nah, I think it's rather straightforward, right? It could be. I, I mean, so it depends. Uh, like. Like um, it, it to me the difficulty was like so for example I mean we can just do this quickly because this is not I don't know if I learned anything about like either causal inference or modeling um, yeah. in a Bayesian way here but like for example the first one like I didn't know are we supposed to think of or is it more productive to think of caramelization as like a binary variable like it either happens or it doesn't because uh, that's kind of the way. The, now, if I look at the phrase, it makes it seem like mm -hmm. caramelizing onions requires. But then I was like, oh, but surely caramelization, I mean, sure, caramelization is kind of a continuous thing because uh, it can an onion can be more or less caramelized. But then I like yeah. need to incorporate temperature into the model. Or sorry, not temperature. I need to incorporate um, time because if I'm doing caramelization as continuous, surely it depends on having the right conditions for a certain amount of time. Uh, and I just, uh, maybe I wasn't supposed to think about it that uh, in depth, but, and, and that I think applied to a lot of them, like what is the actual dependent variable? So like, just to rattle them, rattle them off for two, uh, you know, is it like max speed, like the max speed of a car? I assume it was oh. maybe supposed to be a dependent variable, you know, putting deep or political beliefs as a dependent variable is there. I mean, I study political science, so I have ideas about how it's done. I don't know exactly what he wanted us to do. And then, so I don't know. So for all these, I, the more I thought about it, the more lost I got. <laughs> well, I only think of it as uh, making like a formula um, in R. Uh -huh. So just a simple, um, y is a, and then the tilde and then the um, variable and if there's an interaction you can use like an asterisk to combine the two variables i mean that's um, yeah that is why i said i think it's simple because i'm familiar with um, the r formula and i think you do as well but when yeah. you think about how the variables um, associate with each other and yeah, it can be complicated. Sure. Yeah. And no, I mean, I'm familiar with the formula interface too, but I guess just, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't, I guess what I would say just is like, so for number one, the, uh, it's like, is, is the Y. So, you know, again, so that that's referencing a, a vector in R or a column in R. Mm -hmm. And is that filled up with, Yes, no. Is it a bunch of ones and zeros for caramelized or not caramelized, or is it? Is there a caramelization scale that goes from? Is it continuous from zero to a hundred? That's what I was wondering. And depending well, on which one of those operationalizations or measurements of caramelization you choose, it depends on how you would model it. Or sorry, how you model it depends on that. And and I, I don't feel like that was. So I, my point is that where I got stuck is I don't think where Richard McElroy wants me to get stuck. I got stuck mm. in, a different, in a different place, thinking about something that uh, All right. isn't, uh, isn't that. Um, well, so, yeah. so far, because I think we are mostly working with Gaussian response, Gaussian outcome. So I think he's expecting 
a continuous outcome, right? Probably, yes, I think that makes sense. Uh, all right, but I'm, I'm interested now. So, so you signed up for Medium and I'm interested to see, I'm interested to see what you did. All right. Okay, so let's share my screen. Okay. All right, so I signed up for M1 to M3. And so for the 8 M1, it's about the interaction um, between water and shade. And now we have one more um, variable to think of, which is the temperature. So the way I think about it is just to incorporate in like a three-way interaction between the three parameters. So, so first of all, we have um, each of the, um, oh, doesn't look as nice, each of the um, parameters here. So um, for temperature, water, and shape. And then afterwards, I have a, two, a pairwise two -way interaction among the, with, among the three. So I have the temperature and water, and then afterwards, water and shape, and temperature and shape. And then afterwards, um, I have the three-way uh, interaction between temperature, water, and shape. So this is how I immediately think of it. But then, um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, this is, this is it. I'm trying to think. Um... Yeah, I, I when I did it, I what one difference that I had was that I so he in this book really uh, advocates strongly for not using indicator variables and instead using um, index variables. So in in mine, uh, I replaced alpha in the intercept with. Um, I replaced that with uh, like a, what was it? I replaced it for alpha, but then there's just two alphas. There's the um, mm -hmm. hot and then there's the uh, cold. Because I'm trying to think if you, I, I do think the, I'm trying to think about this, that you would have to have, yeah. I mean, maybe that's actually what you, what you do have for that beta. That's the way you're thinking of it is that it's, one thing for hot, because it's a binary variable, right? Yeah, anyway. it is. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Okay, I'm interested to see this, see this how everything turns to zero when it's hot. Which yeah. Is the next one. Yes, I think it's quite related with um, the second one. So, um, well, when I look at the equation that I have here, and so the basic idea is to, um, to make the equation such that when the temperature is hot, then there should not be any blooms at all, right? Mm -hmm. So then I group um, like the parameters. And I guess this is sort of like the hard way um, about it. So I group the parameters like in pairs of, okay, parameters that doesn't have temperature and uh, those that do have it. So the intercept and just the um, data of the temperature. And then afterwards, um, water and the interaction between temperature and water. So I think of it like, okay, so if the temperature is hot, then it should counteract the um, effect of the other parameter and vice versa. Okay, yeah, so yeah. So it's like one parameter is canceling the other if the temperature is hot. But then when I think about it, maybe an easier approach would be just to code, um, yeah, um, the code temperature. So I'm not entirely sure if I code it as one equals to cold and zero equals to hot, I can still call it an index variable. I guess, I, I guess we just have to call it um, 
an indicator variable. But yes, the idea is if the temperature is zero, so um, hot, then um, yeah, the, all the parameters will be dropped. Or should it be the other way around? Uh, no, I think that, yeah, it's kind of, um, no, no, I'm trying to think about it. So if you were to do that, have a, what did I, what did I write for that one? Uh, yeah I I think the way that you did it first makes the the indicator the ones where they're so the the interaction term is always like the negative of the base term so beta tw is the opposite of uh, beta w beta ts is mm -hmm. the negative of that that was that's what makes a lot of sense and I'm trying to think yeah, to me, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and I'm trying to think, so you, so you write that it's, yeah, it's the mu, it's the mean conditional on um, all the variables being one. And, uh, and so that, that's very, that's very clever. It saves you from writing out a lot of stuff. Um, and I'm just trying to make sure. So one thing that's nice about it is that it, it still equals zero, even when S and W are not one, right? Yeah. Which is, is required by the question. So anyway, so I like that. That was very, that was a very efficient way of writing it out. Yeah. Um, okay. But hold on, so this is what I'm thinking about. So these are code temperature as an index. So yeah, I if we were to maybe do that. Index indicator, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but so when it's hot, I'm trying, to, now I'm looking at the equation that you have. And so what that would mean though, is that like, so for example, beta T would disappear, just all the parameters with the T would disappear because they involve multiplying T, like they involve that temperature column. So, and if, if we were to do that with this parameterization though, that wouldn't. No, yeah, no, no, that wouldn't, yeah, that wouldn't work at all. I think it will require a different equation altogether. But I, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking of something like, okay, if the um, temperature is coded as zero, then the mean will be immediately zero. So, um, Whereas the, yeah, but then I'm not entirely sure how I can code the interaction that way though. So I guess we can just uh, scrape it off the list. No, no, I think I, I remember now when I was saying yeah. this, it, but it's, it's so easy that it's almost like cheating. So it's like when, <laughs> um, it, it's like when, now, now I remember, so for his, uh, ruggedness of terrain in Africa example. So the way he introduces the parameters that the, his preferred way is to have alpha and then country ID. Yeah. And so then that's for an index variable. And then he says, okay, so that, that'll get you different intercepts. But if you want different slopes, he says, well, the traditional way would be to add an indicator variable and blah, blah, blah because you can also do that with an index variable. You just have, you just say you have a slope for when it's in Africa and you say you have a different slope for when it's not in Africa. And so I remember what I was thinking for this one that I just remembered I thought of was that you can just say you have a different slope for all of these when it's hot. So looking at the equation you have, you have, so there'd be no beta TW, for example, it would just be beta W uh -huh. and then subscript T like, and then T is now an index. So you have one slope for beta W when yeah. it's cold and you have one slope for beta W when it's hot. And you just say that beta W hot is zero. And so for example, you say alpha hot is zero, 
beta yeah. s hot is zero. So you just declare all of them zero. And again, it, it feels like cheating, but uh, it is, I'm pretty sure just what he does in the, I mean, it, it's copying what he does in the chapter. Okay, that's it. That's all I've got. All right, Ravens. I didn't, I didn't even think about this one. So I'm curious to see what you have. Okay, so the question is about the association among ravens, prey, and wolves. So um, basically, um, well, I don't know anything about all these uh, animals, but well, I can understand that ravens seem to depend on wolves because wolves can uh, catch the prey and they can uh, open up um, the carcasses so that ravens can eat together. So I, uh, so I can think of, well, the, con the presence of ravens among the wolves would depend on, uh, would be conditioned on the prey because if the wolves are not eating anything, they're not opening any carcasses, then why would ravens hang around the wolves? Well, it's um, kind of weird, but yeah. Uh, why the plot is lost? Okay, should have said. Okay, so um, yeah, so these are just a um, few settings that I have. So the, just the number of simulations, the um, correlation between um, uh, the play and wolves. So, so when I think about it, if there are more prey, then there will be more predator. But it should be the relationship between the two should be nonlinear because I would imagine at some point if there are too many predators, then the number of prey uh, would decrease. But I don't really know how to code it. So I just uh, have it there. And then, yeah, so first I simulate um, the prey. And yeah, I do know, realize now that maybe I should start using the R Poisson, but yeah, we haven't reached um, that part yet. So I just use the R norm and then afterwards force it to integer so that we have whole animals instead of a continuous uh, number of animals, which, is, which doesn't really make sense to me. And then afterwards I um, yeah, simulate walls depending on the prey. And then afterwards, uh, ravens a combination in combination between the two. So when I plot, okay, the axis labels are too small. So here are the ravens and prey. So they are positively associated and ravens and wolves uh, as well. And uh, the prey and wolves as well. But when I model it, and then I see the conditional effects. So between um, ravens and wolves, with um, the interaction of the number of prey, I think I sort of got the simulation right, even though this, uh, well, a full disclaimer, I came to this picture with um, a lot of trial and error. So, but, but what I think um, uh, <coughs> is good about this um, plot is that I can see with a decreasing number of prey. So here we, I have the negative two. Um, Just a uh, quick question. Did, did here. Yeah. Ask, okay, that's what I was going to ask. I was going to ask if you standardized. Yeah, so. I standardized here. So yeah, I should have clarified that. So yeah. So when yeah, there are fewer prey, then the relationship between ravens and wolves are um, are decreasing. But when I think about it, maybe I should have. Um, made it such that when there is zero prey, then there is no ravens at all, because what's the point? But then, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Maybe the ravens will just be there. At least there is like a minimum number of ravens that will hang around the wolves, um, regardless whether the wolves got any carcasses laying around or not. But I, it, I think it would be nice to have some sort of threshold 
but yeah, I really don't know how to uh, do that. So I guess one thing that I have now, um, the uh, decreasing relationship slope between reference on wolf, conditioning on the availability of prey, I think is a, is a good one. Yeah, that's super, super nice looking. I, I like that conditional effects command function. That's really nice for displaying interactions. Oh. Wow. Um, yeah, and what was it that you posted in the Slack about fitting this? There was something about on change. Yeah. So I told you about how I just change the numbers here um, randomly, right? Yeah. And then, so I have the data and then afterwards standardize and so on. So usually I just uh, put the file here, mm -hmm. but then um, when I change the data and uh, I try to run this code without uh, having this argument set, the conditional effects plot looks exactly the same. And I just don't really know why, even though I can confirm that my um, exploratory plots, they, they do change. Mm -hmm. So that yeah, apparently if we set the file, the model, the BRM function will just load uh, what we have in the file. But if we set on change, then it will smartly uh, fig, uh, figure out whether there is any change in the input or in the uh, setting. And yeah, I think it's a bit unfortunate that its default um, setup is not uh, like giving a warning that there is a change in the data. Yeah. Or yeah, but yeah. So oh, I I agree. So what actually happens though, if you, if you erase the line file refit on change and you rerun it, does it just not do anything differently? Like no, what is it? It will, it will just load the fitted model and that's it without, um, yeah, even though the data have changed. Wow. Okay. So, so, but, and then the first time you run it, does it create that file? Yeah, it will. Okay, so do you think what it does under the hood is it, it looks to see if there is a file and if there is that file, it just loads that file. I think so. Huh, okay. That's interesting. Yeah, I think yeah, it's a bit annoying, honestly. Regardless of default, they should have set a warning. Yes. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, that's super cool. I, I uh, well, that's really great to know. So I think you've maybe saved me quite a few headaches by experiencing them yourself. <laughs> right. Um, and that's really cool. I think you you did exactly get what he wanted you to get for. Um, for this problem. So that's really nice. Yeah, the effect of was conditional on prey. I like that. But then, um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure whether I should just scale it, um, scale the prey, for example, with the Z scaling or maybe like a, a zero to one scaling. Because, well, uh, I think he made a lot of. Uh, statements where negative something doesn't really make sense. Maybe negative, like here, negative play doesn't make sense. Maybe zero play makes more sense. But then, yeah, I, I mean, visually I get the same results, I guess. But yeah. it's just so hard to parameterize things um, like what he suggested. I yeah. guess I'm, I'm so used to just plugging everything into the formula and accept everything that it gives me. Uh-huh, me too. Yeah, it's definitely hard. I, I feel like in this one, he he probably would have, you know, I, I don't know. I feel like he probably, I think you're right. He probably would have said zero prey is, 
is meaningful. So it keeps zero. But, well, I don't know. On the other hand, you could say there's always some prey for wolves, unless you're like in the middle of a city or something. I, I don't know. It seems like it's something that a person could argue different ways. Um, anyway, no, that's super cool. Do you want to go on to M4? No, I haven't done this one. OK. Oh. Yeah, I'd be interested to see um, someone else do prior predictive um, uh, modeling in BRMS. So I, I did M4. I'm not convinced at all that I got what he wanted, <laughs> what, what he wanted me to get. But um, I mean, I definitely did prior predictive modeling, and uh, I learned I, that my priors were way too wide. Um, but anyway, that uh, I don't think I got. I'm not satisfied with my own exploration of that one. Um, so I guess in the last 14 minutes. Um, I'll just show what I did. By the way, so you, to get the way that your everything looks right now, you did, what did you knit? Like, what did you, you just are looking at your R mark down. Yes. You're so previewing it. I'm using the official editor in R mark down. That's nice. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what happens if I do that. Wow. Well, yeah. Okay. Nice. Oh, not nice. I uh, I was doing it and I just got an error. Um, anyway. Oh. But uh, this is uh, quite nice. All right. Um, all right. So I'm going to share my screen. And I'm just going to copy you and have a, the visual editor. Um, OK, so here we are. Um, wow, that didn't render very nicely. Anyway, so we're looking at the tulips data. Uh, the first one is very easy. Uh, it's really just, so I, I, I copied everything here. So just loading the tulips data, doing the exact same transformations that he does, um, but then making bed and index variable. So um, the nice thing is that that's very easy to do. You just do as numeric, uh -huh. whatever it is, and it will, um, yes. I think in this case, it was a character column and it just became one, two, three. Okay, yeah. or maybe it was factors, I don't know. In any case, as numeric works on it. So and if I'm not mistaken, in the rethinking package, there is this function called coerce index. I oh. think, yeah. So it There's... will build and check um, index variables for you. Let me, yeah, that is. So. Oh, interesting. I'm not entirely okay. sure what's the difference with asymmetrical. Yeah, maybe it's like um, a shorthand of uh, making the character into a factor and then making it into numeric variables because it will start from one for sure. Yeah. That's a, huh. Okay, I'll have to look at that. Um, but, all right, yes. So in, in, anyway, in this case, yeah, no, need, no need for coaster index as numeric works just fine. Yeah. Um, and then, so I just created two. So th this is exactly, I think maybe, maybe the priors got changed, but, um, oh, sorry. This is the one that he has in the text. So it's just the model with an intercept and then the shade water interaction. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the difference in here is that there's now not one intercept, but there are three intercepts, one for each bed. Um, and also something that I picked up from the chapter that seems very intuitive is that when you do model a variable intercept is to allow it to spread out more than you would the just base intercept. Because you want, I mean, that's, because that's what you want to see. You want to see if yeah. uh, the beds have different effects. So anyway, so, um, so I have these two and then I just 
fit them down here. Um, I'm like a caveman, I'm using QWAP, I'm not using the RMS. Um, and I think this is, and that's actually all, he just tells us to fit it. And I actually kind of got ahead of myself in this one, so I'm gonna save that for a second. Um, oh, blah, 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 okay, oh, I think I didn't, oh, never mind. here it is, sorry. So now we're supposed to use the widely applicable information criterion to compare uh, the model that I, the model with bed to the one that omits bed. And what do I what do I infer? Blah blah blah. Okay, so I should run this now. Does this ever happen with your? So this is me using this for the first time. I don't know why hmm. these aren't running. I might have to switch to the ugly version. Okay, I think I will. I apologize. Yeah, All right, whatever so works. Oh. Okay, so that shows Dr. Nowling. How do I get out? That switches to Visual Editor. How do I get out of Visual Editor? Oh no, am I stuck um, in Visual Editor forever? No. Um, I think I have a newer uh, version of the Art Studio. That is why it works more seamlessly um, in mine. Even the layout of the, of the icons are quite different. Ah, oh, here, switch to source code, okay. Okay. I, I'm just gonna give it a second. It seems like I yeah. was just clicking on it too fast. Um, but I do remember what happens while I wait for this. I'm worried it's taking way too long. Um, in any case, so what happens when you, when one compares the bed fit with the no bed fit is, oh, there it goes. Oh, it just became, it looks the same. I, I think I am stuck in Visual Editor forever. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Oh, well, that's fun. Yeah, it's just not switching. It, I think it thinks it's switching, um, but it's not. Well. Oh, no, it's just going to go back to it. I know. Oh. I know it, hmm. it tricks me. Um, oh, okay. Oh, yeah, it is. Oh, no. Yeah, I, yeah it thinks it's switching. All right, I'm just gonna close this and open it again. And hopefully it will open as. Yeah, honestly, the Art Studio app is not Art Studio's main product, apparently. Yeah. Okay, so anyway, so here's all this. Um, let me just make sure this runs. Okay, good. Okay, so um, this is kind of in the wrong spot, but uh, oh well. So if we compare them, uh, and then why is the default? So we see that the bed fit is better. Um, although that said that the, the difference is only 1.6 and the standard error for the difference is way bigger. One thing that kind of surprises me is that, so you know, if we were looking at this in, back in the day when we looked at differences and then standard errors, we'd say, oh, that's extremely non-significant, you know, just using that kind of like Z-score intuition. Uh, that said though, it, it does have twice as much weight. Wait, to be honest, I still don't quite understand the logic of, I understand maybe in the most general sense, the logic of weight, but um, interpretations of weight are something that I don't know yet. Um, anyway, so this is what, what I get. Um, and so, yeah, so there's that. And so one thing that we do is so we, he asks us to use the weight to compare the model these two models, so that's that. Um, what do I infer? I don't know what I infer, <laughs> to be honest. Um, that bed doesn't make a big difference is one of the things that I would infer, but I'm not an expert at, I'm not, a, I'm not even an intermediate person at reading these tables. So I don't know. Um, one thing that was very interesting, I don't know if you picked up on this or if you read this part in the chapter, but there was one part where it was when he was doing that different slopes in Africa and he showed a, a table like this, and one of them had 97% of the weight, which sounds like a lot. Hmm. And he said, but that 3% that the model without varying, inter, uh, varying slopes has means that the varying slopes model is overfit. He had that comment when I was, and I was like, wow, okay. I wouldn't have guessed that. If I, if I ran a bunch of models, saw that one of them had 97%, I'd say that's the model. That's the good yeah. one. Yeah. 
And I mean, he does say that. He does say the 97% of someone has overwhelming support. But then he says, but it's also overfit, at least a little bit. And I was like, oh, all right, I have a lot to learn still. Um, so, okay. So then there's the question, can you reconcile the WAIC results with the posterior of uh, bed? So to leave the posterior in his way, what you would do is uh, use this function and then you can plot it to make things look a little bit nice. Um, and, and you get this. So uh, these are in standardized blooms uh, because you know, so we're assuming that both water and um, shade are at their means. Uh, and then this is what you get. And so, so the idea is that we're supposed to reconcile, I guess, this distribution of weights with these coefficients. And again, I don't know if I'm interpreting this correctly, but it looks like, for example, we probably don't need to differentiate between beds two and three. I mean, those distributions overlap almost completely. It does look like though, that you know, if I were more diligent, maybe I could combine two and three into one index. And then I would wager that what would happen if I refit it with uh, just two levels of bed, then that model would get more weight because it has fewer parameters. And this, these two yeah. parameters aren't doing anything different. That's what I think would happen. Um, but uh, again, and that's just to improve WAIC. One thing that he emphasizes quite a bit is that we shouldn't be slaves to WAIC because that just looks at um, the predictive ability of our model, not necessarily the causal structure underlying it. So conceptually, we would want to differentiate between the three beds. But um, anyway, so, so that was this exercise. Uh, I didn't do this rugged one, so I'll close that. Oh, I did do it, but it turned out weird. I didn't do another one. I'll do the, these wines really quick. Um, so this one, uh, the first one was, so I wanted to do this one because it sounds fun, uh, you know, looking at different wines. Um, it's a fun little experiment, uh, 20. So there are 20 French wines, sorry, well, 20 wines, half French, half American, nine judges, right? Actually, I don't, does this mean there are 18 judges or there are only nine? I assume that means there are 18. So there's uh, the same number. Uh, I guess I can just do this. Um, there's a distinct line. Oh, do I need to load this? Um, if I do, I guess I can do table, judge, ID X, I just say one. Okay. Oops. So there are only nine judges. All right. So not an even yeah. number. Uh, okay. So just real quick, uh, I did the same thing. Again, not knowing that there was a coerced index. Uh, I did as numeric on both the judges and the wines. And then I scaled the score. Um, and I think that was basically all things he's recommended. One thing that I still need to think about more is um, justifying my, my priors, because that's still the thing that makes my head hurt the most in all of this. Um, so, and we don't, uh, time is not, anyway, gonna allow me to do that. So what did I, what did I do here? I did this a few days ago. So I got the priors out. Um, and so, oh yeah, this doesn't work, I don't think. Yeah, unfortunately, because the plot objects. Oh, actually, this would have worked. Um, oh no, I forget the name of this package. Uh, ah, there's a really nice formatting packages for multiple GG plots. Anyway. Um, oh, you mean patchwork? I do mean patchwork. Library. Okay, so, so this is the prior predictive simulation and it's kind of an interesting one. I, I was just 
it's not any bivariate relationship. It's just, um, so these are the, so one thing that you can see is, first of all, there's a lot more predicted ones. So that's why there's that. But you see that it ranges from negative three to two of actual scaled scores. I have some really extreme ones, which, you know, this is one thing that is a judgment call that I don't know yet. Like, is that good or bad? Like the fact that my predictive prior simulation includes unobserved values. Should I think of that yeah. as like a, saying that my model will be able to, like my priors are vague enough that it can learn or should I say that's bad? That's one of the things I don't, I don't feel comfortable. I would definitely not feel comfortable giving anyone advice yet. For example, like I just don't know. In this case, it feels like they're, they're probably a little too wide, but how much too wide and when is it not too wide? No idea. Hmm. And I guess I'll just I'll just leave it there. I, I did I did quite a bit more, but it's too well, it's the hour is up. Yeah, be, for me, uh, I also think uh, think a bit about it. So um, right now I don't I don't know what standardizing means anymore because at some point he just um, defied a variable with the maximum number for that variable. And sometimes he did the z-scaling. Whereas like for this score, yeah, um, I guess what I would uh, do is just do um, centering and scaling like what you're doing. But then I'm also thinking about dividing the score with the maximum score, but then yeah, I'm not entirely sure how to constrain the outcome. Like, um, yeah, it should be uh, like how to constrain the outcome such that there will be no um, negative score, for example, if we are scaling the outcome with the maximum score. Yeah, yeah so in, in this one, it is an interesting one. Um, so the, the minimum observed score is seven and the maximum is 20. So it's kind of a weird scale. Right. So I wonder if what he would do is uh, subtract seven to get the minimum at zero hmm. and then divide by, that would be 13 then. So then you'd have a zero to one. I don't know, maybe that's what he would. <laughs> uh, so yeah. I, I don't know. I wish yeah. I wish there were like a conversation hour with him where you could just kind of like give him models and like how would you how would you scale these? Just to kind of hear and just hear him talk through it. Like I would just sit there with a cup of coffee, just like listening to that. I would be very interested to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Because scaling and setting priors. If I learn one thing from this book, I hope. It's that by the end of it, I have a good intuition for scaling and setting priors. Yeah, I never really cared about scaling or any manipulation because to me, it actually, it really makes the interpretation of the coefficient um, not straightforward. I mean, I can, without scaling or centering, I can get um, my coefficients and with frequent this regression, I don't even bother look, looking at the intercept. So yeah, it just never passed my mind, um, whatever he's teaching in this um, chapter and the previous ones. I guess that is why he called the book rethinking, but yeah. <laughs>